Don't hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as... He's bored. He's been up here for too long. He's been up here the whole morning. Hello today. Thank you for joining us on this YouTube channel. I'm Jeff from the People's Church in Constantia in Cape Town. If you are ever in this area, you'd be really welcome if you join us on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock or at 11 o'clock. So again, thank you for joining us. I'm going to pray quickly. Thank you, Lord, for your word. May it come alive and touch me and touch my listeners. I ask it in your name. Amen. I'm speaking today about means of grace. The grace of God is infinite. It's the love of God. It won't run out. It won't be uh, distributed on a whimsy. It is there for us. Jesus said, call and I will answer. He said, knock and I will open. He said, seek and you will find. So there is the promise of provision in our lives. But how does the grace actually get channeled into my life? It's not that it's going to run out. It will never run out. There was a hymn uh, written, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The wandering child is reconciled by God's beloved son, the aching soul again made whole and priceless pardon won. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels song. Then listen to these words. It says, could we with ink the oceans fill and were the skies of parchment made where every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. The grace of God is infinite. It can't be, it won't run out. We have the assurance that God's love is always there for us. The grace of God will never run out. My grace runs out. My love might run dry. People that were in love as teenagers, they grow tired of each other. God is not like that. His love is infinite but how does God's love and God's grace come into my experience what is the delivery system how grace comes into your life it's not automatic knock seek call and I will answer but what if you don't seek what if you don't knock what if you don't call what happens God's infinite love but how does it come into my life? What must I do? How do I seek? How do I knock? How do I call? How does the love of God and the grace of God flow into our lives? That is described as the means of grace. In Worcester, maybe it, they don't have it anymore, but in times gone by, they had what they called lay water, Dutch, lead water or canalized water. They had it in Crofronet, and I saw it not long ago. I saw that it still operates. And so what happens is down the sides of the streets, there are canals, and the water runs all the time. And you have a day or two days of the week. And at your allotted hour, you can put your metal sheets down the slots, and redirect that water into your garden and it'll flow to your 
fruit trees or to your grapevine or the veggie patch, wherever you want it. And so you can have an hour of water coming. It is actually built in to the rights of that of that property, to the title deeds. Your your lay water is one of your, is one of your rights. That's an illustration because what happens if you don't have canals bought uh, dug in your garden? Well, the water won't go anywhere. It'll just it'll just be wasted. God's love can be wasted if you don't have canals, if you haven't dug something. So what are the things that direct God's love and care into your life? Well, different people have given lists of what the means of grace actually are. And some have only four, some have seven. There's a variety of them. And I want to focus, give you some and then focus on one at the end. There's communion, breaking of bread, brings God's grace into your life. I could tell you stories about that. There's scripture reading and preaching of God's word. The turning point in my life came. People told me they saw it when I started to read the Bible. Water baptism is a means of grace. Fellowship it says in Hebrews, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. It's a means of grace. Being together with believers is so important. It's, you don't just come to hear a preach and sing a song. Uh, you come to be together with people. That's a means of grace. Somehow God's grace fl flows into your life that way. Singing together, that is a means of grace. Something happens in your heart as you sing and communicate with others. And so... We, for a few moments, I want to speak about the, the channel of the laying on of hands and the anointing with oil. Laying on of hands, anointing with oil. I'll speak mainly about the laying on of hands. Some examples, my means of grace in the Old Testament, some examples. There was Isaac who had a blessing for his two sons, Jacob and Esau. Those sons both wanted it, but Jacob wanted it so badly that he lied and cheated and crooked his father and duped his father into giving him the blessing. His father gave him the blessing. When Esau discovered that Jacob had got the blessing instead of him, it says in Hebrews, he couldn't get the blessing even though he sought it with cries and tears. Esau cried hot tears because he wanted that blessing. What was it that was so important with the laying on of hands of the father that Jacob was willing to lie and cheat in order to get it and Esau would be in tears when he realized what he had lost. You read that verse in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17. There's something mysterious about it, but something very real. The means of grace. Think of Mo Mo Moses and Joshua. It says there in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 9, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to Joshua and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. So something had happened in Joshua's life, something important had happened. <clears throat> Clearly, the blessing of the laying on of hands did something in his life. There was a smooth transition of leadership as well between Joshua <clears throat> and, and Moses. There was no power struggle. There was no ousting of Moses by the young pretender to the throne. The one laid the, his hands on the other and the transition took place. The time is coming. <clears throat> In July 19, uh, 2025, when I'm going to be laying my hands on Hans and Laura Antonio, and some things of grace will flow into their lives, the laying on of hands, and the, something will be, the transition will be smooth and will be blessed, and the change will be significant. Another example of the laying on of hands, there's a, there's a wonderful thing that you can see on YouTube of uh, the audience being made into uh, into a choir. There's a link that you can that you can click on. It's really worth it 
But what the man does, let me describe it to you. He stands on the stage and he's got an audience of several thousand people. And they are just an audience. They're an arbitrary gathering of people that have bought tickets. And he gets them to make a noise, just go, ah, with their voices. And this side, he gets to go up, and this side, he gets to get go down, and he lifts a side, and he lifts that side. And he conducts, and he makes beautiful, surreal music with the people's voices, just by conducting them with their hands. I thought, isn't that marvelous what hands can do? standing on the stage. He has no physical physical connection to their voices. Just with his hands, he is conducting and making beautiful music. It says this, I want men everywhere to pray without wrath and doubting, lifting up holy hands. What happens when people come and they pray and they lift up their hands? There's the example of uh, uh, there's the example in, in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 10. The Amalekites, those were the descendants of Esau, sworn enemies of the descendants of Jacob. We're seeing it right up to this day. Those descendants of Esau attacked in a unprovoked and terrible way. They attacked Israel and so something happened. Moses went up onto the hillside. When he lifted up his hands, Joshua and his troops prevailed. When he lowered his hands, they started to lose. And he went backwards and forwards as he raised his hands and lowered his hands. What was it? Eventually, his hands became so tired and he had to have two men hold up his hands. They gave him a rock to sit on. And as he held up his hands at that evening, they eventually prevailed. There's something special. There's something significant. There's something mysterious, something of mystery with the laying on of hands and with the raising of hands. Let me go to some New Testament examples. A beautiful example is found in Matthew chapter 19. It says, mothers brought Jesus so he could lay his hands on them to bless the, ch the, 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 to bless the children and the disciples chased them away, thinking that Jesus was too busy for the children. But it says this, as Jesus placed his hands on them, Matthew chapter 19, and he blessed them. He put his hands on them and he blessed them. Something was communicated to those children. And I believe that those children were blessed for the rest of their life because Jesus had laid his hands on them. Wouldn't you love to have Jesus lay his hands on your children? Mark chapter 16 and verse 18, they will lay hands on sick people and they will get well. The laying on of hands is a means of grace. The way that that vast love of God, the grace of God, can flow into our existence. It's not the only way that God's grace can come to us. The, remember the Romans said uh, to Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled at his faith. So a word can heal, but the laying on of hands is there. Acts chapter 8 and verse 17, Peter and John went up to, to Samaria and they laid their hands on the Samaritans for the reception of the Holy Spirit. And so they went on a special trip in order to lay their hands and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues and it was a major step forward for that Samaritan church. Another example is in Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. There, let me give you the story. Acts chapter 9. Paul, or Saul as he was called in those days, was on his way to kill Christians. And uh, he was struck down from his donkey. Bright light, a voice from heaven spoke. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he was given instructions when he said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And very interesting there, very interesting, because he says, who are you? He said, you're Jesus. I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But he wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was per persecuting all the little people in the churches. Jesus identified with those people and their, and their sufferings. And so he was sent to a certain address. Ananias had the job that he didn't want. 
go, there's a man called Saul, and you must go and you must lay hands on him. He objected. He said, don't you know who the Saul is? But he was sent by the Holy Spirit. He went into the room where Saul was, laid hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me so that you can see and you can receive the Holy Spirit. And he laid hands on him and Paul could see. And Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment. The grace of God came into Saul's life who became Paul the great apostle, through the laying on of Ananias' hands. So the laying on of hands is something that is evident from the Old Testament. The hands are important. The hands achieve something. In the New Testament, the laying on of hands is, is important. The laying on of hands is also used for commissioning or for ordaining. I'm speaking like this because this Sunday we're going to be ordaining somebody to the ministry. Uh, uh, Aaron Inocenzi is going to be ordained as one of the ministers here in this church. Acts chapter 6 and verse 6, their hands were laid on the seven that were going to attend to the practical challenges and the logistical challenges that the church was facing at that time. Acts chapter 6 and verse 6, something was recognized in these men but then they were ordained. A step was taken. When somebody is ordained, it's not the ordination that makes them. It's the ordination that is the recognition uh, of what God has done in them. But something significant happens when hands are laid on them. Acts chapter 13 and verse 3. Saul and Barnabas, separate for, for me, Saul and Barnabas, for the work I have called them to. God had called them. And so that church in Antioch laid their hands on them and sent them out. They were ordained to a certain task. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Paul gives instruction to Timothy about the laying on of hands. He says, don't do it in a hurry. There's a lot about ordination in, in Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14 says, Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Timothy was a young man that was being ordained to the ministry. He was going to go traveling as an understudy, traveling with Paul. And so they had a day when the church gathered there were many people that were present there, you know, from other references to this occasion. And the poor lady's hands, together with the elders, on Timothy. There was a prophecy or a tongues and interpretation and something wonderful and powerful and life-changing happened to Timothy as the hands were laid on him. Timothy, timid Timothy, was changed. Something powerful happened. A gift was given to him at that time. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 22 says, You mustn't lay hands on people in a hurry. You must let them be proved. You must be sure about the role that they're going to be taking because if they are pushed into the situation or they grasp a situation and they make mistakes, you also are responsible for the mistakes because you push them there into that situation too rapidly. And so uh, don't do it in a hasty way. You must do it in a considered way. <clears throat> another occasion, another reference rather to the occasion when Timothy was ordained uh, is in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And so they gave a charge to Timothy, and Ch Timothy made a good confession. And so Timothy was ordained. It was a significant moment in his life and in the life of the New Testament church. Something happened when hands were laid on him. Later on in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul draws Timothy's attention back to his ordination. And he says, stir up the gift that was given to you when your hands 
were laid on you, when my hands were laid on you. And so it is that the laying on of hands is a very important thing to do. Your hands are important. Blessing comes into your life when you raise hands and praise God, when you sing, when you bless. Something comes into your life when people lay their hands on you and when they pray for you, when, for ordination, for healing, for deliverance, or whatever it may be, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, laying on of hands. Let me end this by telling you a story. My sister had a friend called Frances van Eden. She got married and her name changed and not in contact with her any longer. But her father was a diplomat and he was based overseas and she was a teenager in her mid-teens and she was listening to a preacher called Oral Roberts preaching on the TV. Her family weren't believers, she had no connection with church whatsoever and she was watching this TV program and she had a problem in her life and she didn't know Jesus as her saviour and so Oral Roberts said if you're sitting in a room and you're watching this on TV, as he knew they were, he said, and you want to respond by faith, faith needs to have a connecting point. Faith needs to have some place where your action and God's grace connects. There needs to be a means of delivery, a, a means of grace. He said, get up, walk across the room, Place your hand on the TV set and pray this prayer. She was by herself in the room and she did what she said, what he said. She got up, she walked across the room and she placed her hand on the TV set and she prayed the prayer. As she prayed that prayer, she felt God's presence come into her life. Something happened, her life was changed in a complete and wonderful way. Did something come through the TV set? No. Did something come through the TV set? Yes. Because if she hadn't, if she'd done nothing, nothing would have happened. If she hadn't knocked, if she hadn't called, if she hadn't sought, that means of grace wouldn't have flowed into her life. Faith requires you to dig the channel into your life for something to happen. It's a simple illustration that I've given of what happened to Frances. When we met Frances, she was definitely born again. She was a fervent follower of Jesus. And the thing that had been troubling her had been dealt with. And I want to say to you right now, there is a means of grace that can come into your heart and life right now. The love of God is there. The grace of God cannot be used up in any way. It is there in abundance. It is flowing past your front doorstep. You need to drop that metal sheet and allow the water to flow. You need to dig that channel so that water can flow into your parched root system so that something can happen in your life. And so I'm going to make a suggestion here. As I'm praying right now, just take your hand and place it on your heart and, and, and I'm going to pray a prayer. It'll be your way of responding. And so we come to you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that your grace and provision, your forgiveness, the anointing of your Holy Spirit, the wonder of your love might flood into our hearts as we respond in this simple way. So simple that it seems like a, a, for a child. But you said, unless we become like children, we won't even see the kingdom of heaven. Now, Lord, do what is needed in these people's hearts and lives. 
I pray it in your name. Amen. Please don't do that. He's destroying it. Um, it says, of heaven belongs to such as end. And so uh, this, that dog is just so bored 